when I originally talked to the society about coming here and speaking, the uh, question is, well, talk about the book. And I said, well, let's broaden it a little bit. And we'll talk about the movement of sediment. And they said, well, we have to have a shorter title, so we'll put dredging in. So I'm going to talk mostly about uh, dredging, and, uh, but there will be other aspects. And it won't be all Stony Brook Harbor. We'll go out to Smithdown Bay. So this is a uh, picture of disposal of dredge spoil along West Meadow Beach. This goes back to the late 1990s. You can still see the uh, cottages here, but this is how the process was carried out. They built this berm, and then they shoot the dredge material in here to fill in. And um, we'll see why they have to do that at West Meadow Beach in a little bit. I love this picture. This picture was taken in 1937, but it really shows you the beauty of natural forces moving sediment around in our local community. So. This is Stony Brook Harbor, this is the South End, this is the West Meadow Beach, and you can see all the cottages, this is West Meadow Creek, this is over at Long Beach, this beautiful sand wave out here, this is the main channel going into the harbor. Notice that uh, the extensive wetlands going back to 1937, this is the Yacht Club, this was old wetland, it's now a parking lot, <laughs> and sand and gravel, Christian Avenue, Erland Road, um, but it really shows you the importance of moving sand, and particularly in this photograph, you can see the impact of the erosion of the Nisiquag Bluffs up here, forming the spit and forming this offshore bar, which uh, can be a hazard to navigation sometimes. So, sediment movement in the harbor, we're going to talk about not only Stony Brook, we'll talk a little bit about Paxcon and Smithtown Bay. This is in the main channel entering Stony Brook, and this is one of the dredges that was here a few years ago. And as I note down here, dredging in the harbor is probably one of the most contentious environmental issues that confronts our local community. But the thing that we have to remember is it's the movement of sediment that has actually created the environment in which we're living. There would be no Stony Brook Harbor without the movement of sediment, uh, without the erosion of the Nissaquad Bluffs, without the erosion of Crane Neck. Stony Brook Harbor would not exist. So it's very important as we try to manage sediments moving forward that we remember that our very existence in this community depends on the movement of that sediment. So we don't always want to pick it up, put it somewhere else, or totally stop erosion. Because with sea level rise, the barrier beaches that form our community, in fact, could be in jeopardy. So these are some of the comments that have been made a few, uh, well, a few of 150 years ago or so. This is from Benjamin Thompson, the Thompson House. And he's talking about the harbors and the North Shore and talking about uh, the shallowness of the entrances to the harbor. And I point this out because many people around here, people, particularly people that are interested in commercial interests in Stony Brook Harbor and elsewhere, say there used to be big ships come in to Stony Brook Harbor or to Port Jefferson and so forth. But you have to keep in mind how those ships came in. They came in on a high water. They put them in blocks uh, on occasion and uh, to unload them. And they let them sit there and they unloaded them at low water. And then they sailed again at high water. So Stony Brook Harbor, uh, Nisquark River, they were not deep water ports. And so is indicated uh, in these quotes. And this is from uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's predecessor uh, organization where they talk about the entrance to Stony Brook Harbor only being about two and a half feet, which in fact it still is today. Uh, so this is Long Beach. This is an indication of where some of the dredge materials bond here, 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 here. This was done in 
in the 1960s. Most of the wetlands that have been lost in, wet, in uh, Stony Brook Harbor, in fact, were lost because of dredge material being placed on top of them. And uh, I didn't forget now how many acres we lost, but it's a considerable amount. Um, the reason I really want to show this, though, is that it shows the growth of the spit at Long Beach and thus the formation of the harbor itself. So we've taken cores over the years in the wetlands around the harbor, and I have uh, several indicated here. So Long Beach too is the oldest, 1,500 years old. If you go out here, I think it's uh, YI2, this is 850 years old. And then Long Beach 1 is 500 years old. And so you can see from dating these cores, the length of time that it took to build the spit at Long Beach, because no wetland would have formed uh, prior to that spit having actually been put in place. And that all comes from the erosion of these Nisquag Bluffs. West Meadow spit is formed primarily by the erosion of the bluffs of Crane Neck and uh, that sediment moving south. And here you can see the growth of Long Beach over time. The black goes back to the 1800s. The red is 1999. Uh, West Meadow Spit hasn't really grown to the south all that much in the same time. So this is how the spit is formed. This is over at Long Beach. This was in, this was the weekend after the first nor'easter. And here you can see how much of the bluff has been eroded just almost instantaneously. These bluffs lose about two to three feet uh, a year. This is the same bluffs just a little bit further to the west. Here you can see where a homeowner spent a lot of money terracing this. This was last October. This is the same bluff on March 4th this year. Give you the, an idea of the impact of wind, waves, and currents. And just to point this out, here he's got a nice seawall, supposedly to protect the erosion of the bluff. But what he didn't account for is the runoff coming over the top and the wind. This is some of the stairs uh, and one of the features on the Nisiqua Bluffs. And here you can see this nice, beautiful set of stairs going into the beach and here it's hanging uh, free after March 4th. And this is the erosion of the stone wall. Just gives you an idea of the power of waves. And this was not a particularly bad storm, as some storms go. Sea level rise, for example, or storm surge was not particularly high in this relative to, say, the Sandy or the December 1992 storm that we had here. So, the bluff, or the uh, spit, continues to grow to the east, northeast. And here, this gives you an idea of how rapidly it was growing between 1886 and 1967. It grew roughly 2.8 yards to the east, northeast. And from now, from 67 on, it's growing about 2 yards to the east, northeast. This has very interesting ramifications in the politics of Smithtown and Brookhaven, uh, which I'll show you a little bit later. But this growth continues to move this way. It impinges, it causes the current to impinge on the West Meadow spit. It gradually begins to eat away, the currents eat away at the spit, and that's why Every now and then, we have to re-nourish uh, the beach on West Meadow Beach. So, dredging in the harbor. This is nothing new. It actually was proposed in the early 1800s. 
And the first dredging that did take place was a consequence of William Sidney Mount. Now, William Sidney Mount was a very famous painter. If you go to the Long Island Museum down here, you can see his paintings. And one of the great things about his paintings is that they were very realistic. So if you want to see the type of grasses and so forth that were growing at the time, you can go look at his paintings. We didn't have photographs, but they're absolutely gorgeous paintings and very, I think, reliable with regard to trying to reconstruct some of the history. <coughs> this is the south end of Stony Brook Harbor, a painting by Mount. And here you can see the boat has come in. They've put cradles under it, and they're unloading it. You can see a horse and wagon here if it's a little bit uh, more clear, and I think there's a bicycle in it as well. This is West Meadow Beach, uh, South End. The Gamecock Cottage is down here. And one of the reasons I like to show this is that people have said that there was deep water going into the creek. Well, here you can see a horse and wagon going across it with only about half the wheels showing. Um, so at low water, there was probably no more than two or three feet of uh, water in West Meadow Creek a hundred years ago. So we're going to talk a little bit about the time of Sydney Mount in the early 20th century as we go forward. This is a notice that William Sydney Mount posted on one of the public buildings in the 1840s, I believe it was, uh, saying why we needed to dredge the harbor. And his idea was Stony Brook Harbor was commercially poor. It didn't have a, a lot coming in and out of it. And that he envisioned that it could be made into a great port if only there was a, a dredge channel through the Nisquag Beach, right where the bluffs meet Long Beach. And his idea was that uh, if you were a vessel coming from the east, you could enter the main channel, Stony Brook Harbor, and you could offload your goods. And then as you leave to go to New York, you could leave going through the western entrance that he was going to dredge. So he proposed this, and he convinced the, many of the Smith family to actually uh, go ahead and begin the, uh, the dredging. And so they used horses, and they plows, then they dug out the beach from the sand towards the harbor. They left a barrier, then they went from the harbor towards the barrier, and the idea was on the last day they would dredge out that last little barrier, and then the flooding current would rush through the inlet, and the inlet would be kept open from then on. The inlet lasted about three months. Uh, he did it during winter, and uh, there was a lot of sand being eroded, and that channel just filled in. And he was never able to convince the uh, Smith family and others to try it again. So it's permanently closed. But this is his vision of the inlet and a boat going through it. So here you can see the barriers uh, that uh, were to be built. And this is a, a sketch from his notes that are in the uh, Long Island Museum. Moving on to the 20th century, uh, this is some of the proposed activities that were put forward. I think it's uh, really rather remarkable if you look at the depths that were proposed. In this one, 1918, they were going to dredge the harbor to 12 feet. It was rejected by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. 1920, Ward Melville, he created the boat, a boat basin up by the Old Field Club. And that was at one time, I believe, to be a, a boat basin for yachts and so forth. And it was partially completed. Today, that hole is about 17 feet deep. It's about the deepest place in all of Stony Brook Harbor. And when you go out there in the summer, in fact, it's anoxic because there's very poor circulation in the harbor. 
anoxic, meaning low dissolved oxygen. Commodore Wells, Wells Boatyard, uh, proposed a 7,000 foot channel, 300 feet wide and 42 feet deep. Can you believe that? 42 feet deep in Stony Brook Harbor. This was primarily for the purposes of extracting sand and gravel for the purposes of construction. And the Brookhaven uh, Committee of 600 um, in uh, Smithtown objected to the uh, dredging. And it was really um, very interesting. This was probably one of the earliest environmental efforts in New York State to prohibit commercial activities any place in the state. And it was run by a group of lawyers. Uh, and if you go back and read their notes, it's really surprising how much knowledge they actually had concerning the physical processes of water movement in New York Harbor. So I'm always bad mouthing lawyers, but I gotta give these guys a lot of credit for the knowledge they had, and it was basically because they were all uh, voters themselves. And then in the late 1930s, the Great Eastern Gravel Corporation once again proposed to dredge a deep channel, 45 feet deep, and the Stony Brook Harbor Association, which came out of the Committee of 600, stopped it. It's also interesting to note that the uh, entrance to the harbor was not to be dredged. They were only interested in the, in the sand and gravel in the interior of the harbor. I don't know if it had to do with quality or what, but they told the town of Brookhaven that if you wanted to, if they wanted to have a deep water entrance, that the town would actually have to dredge the entrance itself. They would not do it. So these are the things that dredging can do. They can alter the symmetry or the shape of the bottom. They can totally change the hydrodynamics of the area. They can change sedimentation patterns. And they introduce artificial supply of sediments through resuspension and destabilization of channels. And maybe most importantly, it destroys the benthic organisms that live in the bottom. So, so those are some of the problems that uh, gener are generated, in fact, when dredging does take place. And just to give you an idea of some of the interesting hydrodynamics of the harbor, the red curve here is the tide curve in Smithtown Bay. The blue is in Stony Brook Harbor. And the thing that's interesting to note is that the high waters are about the same, but the low waters are about a one and a half to two feet lower or higher in Stony Brook Harbor than in uh, Smithtown Bay. And that the low waters in Stony Brook Harbor occur on the order of an hour and a half after and as a consequence because roughly the same amount of water that comes in. What this means, uh, what it means in at least, is water, water runs in very rapidly, very quickly. Turns in over a period of five hours, and then it leaves over and a it's a period of seven hours. Sediment, hour. sediment, sediment is picked up from Smithtown Bay. It is brought in with those very strong currents. It's deposited within the harbor and within the channels that are dredged there. And today we dredge Corpus Channel, the main channel going down to right about here where the Stony Brook Yacht Club is. This channel goes back into here. Uh, and the agreement with the town of Brookhaven, down of Smithtown, and the two villages of Missaquag and head of the harbor is that those channels will be six feet deep at low water. There is no dredging of the channel, the main channel coming in uh, out from Smithtown Bay. All right, so sediment accretion in the Southern Harbor between 1886 and 1967 is about twice that of the of today. And part of the reason is that the dredge channels themselves serve as a sediment trap. 
So when they dig the channels, uh, the water flows down because it's deeper, and sediment material begins to fall out more quickly. So the channels fill in rather quickly. And then another thing of, of that has occurred is that farming really doesn't take place here anymore. And as a consequence, we don't have the runoff of sediment going into the southern harbor the way it once did. So dredging and the change of our lifestyle around here has completely changed the input of sediment to uh, Stony Brook Harbor. And there have been a number of proposals about dredging and how deep to dredge. Um, probably one of the most common is that if we dredge deeper than six feet, that the dredging will last longer and as a consequence it will cost less. So there have been proposals to, first of all, leave it at six feet, but also to dredge to nine feet and to dredge to 12 feet. So this is the kind of thing that you can learn from running hydrodynamic models uh, in an area like Stony Brook Harbor. So if we look at what if we dredge to nine feet as opposed to six feet, so we would lower low water another tenth of a foot or so, we would increase the drying time of the sediments in the harbor about 45 minutes. And the number of acres that would be dry compared to at six feet would go to 377. And um, similarly, if you dare to dredge to 12, you get even greater uh, changes. And the number of acres that would be dried in at low water would be about 382 acres if you dredge to 12 feet. So you have to make up your mind, is this good, bad, or indifferent? If you're a plan, you might not like it. And this is how you would change the time of the tides in uh, Stony Brook Harbor if you dredge to 12 feet. So under existing conditions, the uh, time of tidal rise is five hours and 10 minutes, the falls a little over seven hours. But if you went to 12 feet, this would go to five hours and 37 minutes, and then this would go to six hours and 46 minutes uh, for the, for, yeah. So why would anybody care? Well, what you're doing is you're changing the balance of uh, the tide, tidal rise or the ebb and flow of the current considerably, and uh, you have actually a greater chance of transporting some of the bad things that uh, are in, Stone, in uh, Smithtown Bay uh, coming into the harbor. So one of the things that, is, uh, that does occur in Smithtown Harbor, which is quite different than most of the sound in our neck of the woods, the Smithtown Bay goes anoxic in summer. So there would be a period of time uh, that if you dredged too deep, that you would actually have the possibility of transporting low dissolved oxygen from Smithtown Bay into Stony Brook Harbor. And that uh, probably wouldn't be a particularly good thing. It would also change the sediments. Some of the sediments in Smithtown Bay are very fine grain, and uh, instead of falling out uh, in the deeper part of Smithtown Bay, they might likely would be able to be transported a little, a little easier into Sunny Brook Harbor as well. And so it would change the uh, characteristics of the sediment in the bay. This is a history of dredging projects in the bay, 1953. 1958, 325,000 cubic yards of material. 1965, 320,000 uh, cubic yards of material. This is the period when the wetlands were essentially filled with dredge material. Uh, and it was before the New York State DEC in 1973 put a halt to filling uh, wetlands. Ever since then, about every five or six years, 
we've had to uh, dredge to keep the main channels open. And if the last dredging was just this past winter, where about 38,000 um, cubic yards were removed, and they were pumped to uh, West Meadow Beach. And they were pumped to West Meadow Beach because, as I mentioned to you before, the uh, Long Beach Peninsula is uh, moving to east or east, and the current is gouging out a portion of West Meadow Beach. So there are some management plans in the harbor. Town, Smithtown has a um, management plan for dredge material, as does Village of Nisiquag and Head of the Harbor. This is overseen by the New York State Department of State, and so this is part of the uh, permitting process if you want to move forward. Brookhaven doesn't have a local waterfront re revitalization program for Stony Brook Harbor, but they entered the debate uh, more as a, as a town without a management plan for this particular body of water. All right, what's happening here? Whoops. There we go. Now, I mentioned to you that there's boundary disputes between Smithtown and Brookhaven. The boundary between Smithtown and Brookhaven through Stony Brook Harbor has never been resolved. Uh, for almost 150 years, it has been debated and nobody's ever come to a, a solution that's acceptable. So if you go back to the early 1900s and you read the documentation, it says that the boundary between the two towns starts at a tree trunk uh, up by the middle pond in Stony Brook and it runs thus down the, the uh, Stony Brook and then to the main channel of Stony Brook Harbor along the main channel and out into Long Island Sound. And so that was all well and good. Nobody really paid too much attention to it after that. It seemed reasonable. And then in 19, the 1960s, they did these massive dredgings. So the main channel switched from what was what we now call Corpus Channel to the main channel. So Brookhaven Channel says, aha, you go back and you read the early 1900 records and it says that it goes down the deepest part of the channel out into Long Island Sound. And the town of Smithtown says, no way. You're not going to take Smithtown property just because a channel was bridged. So they warred over that. And uh, then they just decided it's better not to talk about it. At one point, because of the growth of, Smith, of uh, Long Beach, the town of Brookhaven says, oh, but in the 1800s, the channel ended here, and so the boundary goes out here. And the end of Long Beach now belongs to the town of Brookhaven. And Smithtown says, oh, no, you don't. Uh, that would mean that Brookhaven had total control over the entrance to the harbor. And we don't want that to happen. And so they aren't talking about it again. It's now the convention is that it's going out through the main channel into, into Smithtown Bay. And nobody talk, wants to talk about it and settle the dispute. Uh, with regard to whether or not the courts would agree with Smithtown and Brookhaven. It's probably pretty clear that they would agree with the intent with Smithtown because uh, accretion goes to the property owner, and in this case, the original property owner is the town of Smithtown, and hence any new material here is uh, is in Smithtown. But Brookhaven does have a concern because as this keeps moving in this direction, it gouges out West Meadow Beach here, and if the channel is not bridged in here, eventually this could grow into here and actually cut off uh, 
West Meadow, south end of West Meadow Creek, and the entrance would come over here. So in a sense, dredging is probably uh, pretty good for stabilizing the boundary dispute between Brookhaven and Westmeadow. So, last thing I want to talk about is environmental dredging. And I think uh, Fox Pond is a great example. This is Fox Pond and its entrance in 1947, right after the jetties were put in and the channel was established. This is it today. Uh, these are the two jetties here and here. Two, roughly two thirds of the entrance is blocked by sediment. This goes back to 1929. Here's the entrance today with the jetties. The entrance in 1929 was here. And notice that the channel runs to the east, and so it fills from the east. And this was kept open by plows and horses uh, very difficultly since 1803 uh, when Fox Pond was converted to a saltwater pond from being a freshwater pond. Flax Pond is, I guess you would probably say, a naturalizing pond. It's been highly manipulated over the years. Here we got mosquito ditching. There was essentially uh, a bulkhead that ran all along the south end of the, uh, of the pond. This is an artificial boat basin. You still see the remnants of that. This was all part of the child's mansion, and uh, you can still see some of the bulkhead here. There was agriculture going right up to the edge. Problem today with uh, Flax Pond is that uh, the tidal range in the pond, and thus the flushing of the pond, has been seriously reduced. And since 1970, the brown curve here, representing the tide rise and fall in flax, has decreased, or the range has decreased, on the order of about two feet. So the channel is filling in, and because the channel is filling in, it's totally changing the ecological functioning of the pond. And so those of us that are interested in, in the pond, either as a university employee or a naturalist and so forth, we would like to see it once again simulate what is going on in Long Island Sound, which is the uh, blue curve that you hear, see here, the rise and fall of the tide. And to do that, you have to open up the, uh, the entrance to the pond. And this will just give you an idea of how the pond Tidal range has changed over time. This is Bridgeport. The tidal range is there about uh, 6.8 feet. In the in 1970, the tidal range in uh, Flax was on the order of six feet. By uh, 2005, it was only about 4.2 feet, and today it's about 3.8 feet. So it's changing dramatically. And it's because the jetties that are there are channeling sediment into the pond. And here you can see it very nicely. This is Long Island Sound here. And this is the, at the interior of the pond. Essentially, every point in the graph follows these yellow pins. And so all of this, all of this has accumulated in the 50 years or so since the jetties were first installed. So right now uh, the village of Oldfield has an application in front of uh, Suffolk County to do some dredging in here to essentially remove this wedge of sediment that occurs going through uh, here in order to open up the pond once again. And the and benefits, and this is what we university had to do to help Oldfield with the application, is to show that there really are environmental benefits. And the reason I mention that is that I can't tell you how many people go to Suffolk County and say, the world will be a better place if you let me dredge. We'll get rid of mosquitoes, 
we'll solve this problem, we'll solve that problem. And so the Suffolk County uh, Department of Public Works has said, we're gonna set the bar very high. You're really gonna have to show us that there are definitive uh, benefits to dredge for environmental purposes. And so what we were able to show is that uh, we will be able to reduce the residence time where the time water stays in the pond from about 3.3 ebb cycles today back to about 1.5 ebb cycles, which was the case in 1960s, 1970s. And why is that important? Well, we'll flush out uh, a number of the contaminants that are now accumulating in the pond, one of which is coliform. So the pond is now totally closed to shell fishing. Uh, ecologically, that might be a great thing because you can't take shellfish, so shellfish are thriving in there, but you also can't eat them. Uh, the volume of hypoxic water that occurs in the pond, particularly during summer at nighttime, uh, would be reduced on the order of 8,000 to 112,000 cubic meters. And the reduction of open water at uh, low water uh, would be considerable, going from about 100, um, what is it, 114,000 down to, to 72. Why is that important? It's important because right now the marsh is not draining. Water uh, is retained in the pond that eats away at the roots and as a consequence, a lot of the native marsh grasses that we're interested in and concerned about in a healthy marsh are not thriving as well as they should. So these are ecological benefits that we've had to uh, prove to Suffolk County in order to try to get an environmental dredging permit. Uh, we still don't have it, but I've been told that uh, there's a good chance that it will be approved within uh, a month or so. So, that's uh, sort of, the, in a nutshell, some of the issues with regard to dredging. It's good, it's bad, but you really need to understand the consequences of that dredging before you just blindly move forward and implement it. And I leave you with this nice painting of William Sidney Mount. This was done in the probably 1850s or so. This is Crane Neck. This is looking over West Meadow Creek. And this is that big sandbar that you can walk out on every uh, day, just about, usually in summer months. It goes about a third of the mile into Long Island Sound. And it's the favorite playground of everybody. And so this is a great example of what happens when you have converging current coming from the Nisiquag Bluffs over here and a current coming from the Crane Neck Bluffs uh, to the north. You get that huge, beautiful sandbar that people go out, play on, and take clams from. And this conservation is, uh, I think, a very wise statement. In the end, we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand and we will understand only what we are taught. Remember that. <laughs> okay, I'll take questions. Yes. Yes, sir. Um, Larry, as far as uh, Smithtown uh, Bay is concerned, in, in channel in there, uh, how does the dredging affect the production of wetlands around the edge? Uh, there are no wetlands around the edge of the, bay, the outer bay. It's all behind the barrier beaches. Yes. So uh, when you dredge, you increase the currents, uh, uh, you know, initially going through it. And so we tend to erode the, the fringy wetlands right down by the water. So for example, if you're over on Long Beach, there is a very small strip, a strip of Spartina alterniflora uh, there that becomes vulnerable to being washed away. Uh, if you 
uh, go down closer to the dot basin and you dredge the channel further to the south than it currently is, uh, you will begin to uh, let the water flow more rapidly to the south. It will begin to erode the wetlands that are sort of in the center of, of Sunny Brook Harbor. And what's the solution to that? Uh, well, if you ask me, you don't let them dredge. So, uh, you know, um, there's been constant pressure to dredge Stony Brook uh, uh, Creek. And to do that, right now that creek is beginning to heal itself from the dredging that took place in the 1960s. And uh, you may remember, it was before my time here, but that entire area uh, in, the, in the vicinity of the um, boat works, that was all marsh. And that was dredged away in the 60s. It's starting to heal itself by sand accumulating. Eventually, marsh grass will begin to grow there again. Um, but if you continue to push to dredge further to the south, that won't happen. Yes? In regard to that area, I've swam in I-86. I have swam in that area all my life. They changed the dredging, trains changed the entrance to the Stony Brook Hall. It used, what he's saying also, around the end and it was slow. There was no dredging when I was a kid. There was no dirt in front of the yacht club and all that dredging. The Nissapog area is now going to be a sandbar. That was a count of the dredging that changed the flow of the waters. As instead of just coming in, going around the side, Sand Street, and coming out, it came like a suction cup. And the dredges used us because one of my sons, my daughter's friends, said, I'm leaving that company because they're putting all their sand in front of the yacht club and everything. That was never there. There was no dredging. I swam in that water from the 40s, not the now, I know, old times, but I did. That was caused by the dredging. And you're very right about other things, but that thing should never have allowed to happen. It should not allow that they put the sand in the middle of course from them. And now down there, as far as this log, it's going to be a sandbar. And the yacht club is not going to be a yacht club because they'd be sitting on sand. So what was the improvement of that? You're right with a lot of things, doctor. You're definitely right. But that area, I know, I swim. Uh, in dredging, in my opinion, dredging forgets dredging. Uh, that means you have to keep it. Once you start, you got to keep going. They should never have done that. They well, they maybe they do. Yeah, Let the water come around the side. So now we have to maintain it. Uh, and one of the things that I think. Uh, You're right about that. What, one of the things that you have to consider is the constant pressure from, um, you know, the boating people. Boats get bigger, drafts get deeper. They're not going in there anymore. I hate to interrupt you. There's going to be no boats going to the yacht club because it's filling in like hell. Well, it, it is to a certain extent, but it was just dredged again, so they shouldn't be able to get in now um, very easily. Go back in the old flow where the water came in on the sand street and around. Yeah. That didn't help. Instead of the suction cup, the suck water. I swam for a whole life in that car, and I know it. It was a, yes, I have to do it. I know it. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Eventually, it will become nothing but uh, a muddy shoal if the uh, marsh grasses uh, uh, die. One of the interesting things that is occurring that you can very easily see in Flax Pond is actually the impact of sea level rise. If you uh, go to Flax Pond and you walk around in it, you will see debris that is washed in from storm surges and so forth today that are much higher than they've ever been in history. They're actually in the woods. 
And so you, if you want to see the evidence that sea level is rising, just go to Flax Pond and walk around in the woods and you'll see the trash. Well, all that kind of flooding is causing the high marsh grasses to die as a, a Spartina patent. So the, that's dying off. Um, maybe it will be replaced after the trees and so forth die because of the roots getting salty. So Flax Pond is um, indeed uh, threatened by a number of things. But one of the major things is it's not draining well. Yes, anybody else? Okay, let's have a big round of applause.